As the Buddha said, there are three roots of unskillful behavior. Passion, aversion, delusion. With delusion the big one. Passion and aversion gain their power from delusion, which is not simply a matter of not knowing, but often it's a matter of lying to yourself. of setting up walls in the mind. And it's learning how to take down those walls and really tell the truth to yourself. That's often what strips these roots of their power. For example, with passion, that chant we had just now, and the reflecting the parts of the body. It's not a complete chant. There are lots of other parts that aren't listed. But it's enough to remind us that if you're feeling lust for the body, desire for the body, attachment to your body, attachment to someone else's body, it's because you're not telling yourself the whole story. You're focusing on a few details. A glance, a word this part of the body, that part of the body that you can weave into a story. And the whole point of the story is that it acts as a disguise. It's like a cloth that we weave to cover up parts of the body. Well, in this case, it's to cover up what lies inside. Even what lies outside, if you look at it very carefully, there's nothing really to excite, excite lust. If you took hair of the head, put it in one pile, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, put them in separate piles, and looked at them, would there be anything to really get attached to? Not really. The nature of the body is such that if we didn't bathe it, didn't take care of it, after all, we get so that we could hardly live with ourselves, much less get near other people. And these are the things we don't like to think about. And then you go inside the body, all those different organs, and all the different fluids in the body. If you take the whole story into consideration, there's really nothing you can get excited about. So this is what, one of the things we do as meditators. We have to look at the whole story. And that's just the physical side of the lust. Then there's the, the stories that we tell about the activities, what's going to happen. And we don't like to think of all the deceit that goes into a lot of relationships. the calculations, the strategies. And the fact that the other person, if you fall in love with them, doesn't really belong to you. As the Buddha said, it's like taking someone else's property and using it as your own for a while. And they can take it back whenever they want. It's like that story John Lee told himself when he was thinking of disrobing. He said, well, other people, when they get ready to disrobe, they get a pair of lay pants and a shirt, a little bit of money. He says, but he wanted to prepare himself mentally, not just physically. So he went up and thought through the story. What would it be like if he disrobed? And in the beginning of the story, it's nice. He gets a good job, and then it starts getting unrealistic. He gets a, a woman from a social class way beyond what he could possibly attain. But then it takes a realistic turn, realizing that a woman that delicately brought up wouldn't be able to work. Her parents wouldn't accept him as a son-in-law. And so in his story, she gives birth to a child and dies. Then he has to hire a wet nurse, and after a while falls in love with a wet nurse. And she, at first she's good with the other woman's child, but then she has a child of her own, and then she starts playing favorites. Every time he comes home from work and he's realized that at work there's no more chance for advancement given his level of education. 
comes home from work, and there are three different versions of what happened and why everybody's upset. And in the story, he says to himself, boy, if I only hadn't disrobed. And then he remembers, of course, he hasn't disrobed yet. Gives him the energy to stay on. But it's the fact that he was willing to look at all sides of the story, and not just the one he, the sides that he wanted to hear or wanted to think about, that helped cut through a lot of his delusion. And the delusion cut through the lust, cut through the desire. Ending the delusion cut through the lust, cut through the desire, all the other unskillful qualities that developed around it. And so as you find yourself being attracted to something, remember, look at things with two eyes, not with just one. Look for the whole story, every aspect. Otherwise you fall for the tricks that the mind likes to play on itself. It wants to believe something, and it's willing to hide all kinds of things from itself in order to hold on to its belief. Same as what, when you want to believe that somebody's totally bad. You forget about all the good things they do, all the good things they've done, the good things they've said. And you tell yourself only one side of the story. This is how all the all the unskillful behavior in the world gets started. We look at things only partially. We listen to the side of the story, only the side that we want to hear. For the sake of the lust we want to engender, or the sake of the anger we want to engender. This is where the Buddhist term asawa comes in, something that flows out of the mind. We tend to think that other people's behavior either attracts us or repels us, or the features of certain objects attract us or repel us. But they have other features as well. People have other actions as well. Largely what it is is the mind is out looking for something to get worked up about, looking for something to get angry about, looking for something to lust after. And it casts its gaze around and finds something that at least gives a little bit of grounding, a place for that desire to land. And then it can embroider on that. And if anything out there in reality doesn't fall in line with what it wants, it just ignores it, puts up a wall throws a veil over it. And many people have commented on the Buddha's list of roots of unskillful behavior. Passion, aversion, delusion. Where's the fear? A lot of modern psychology derives a lot of unskillful behavior from fear. And it's interesting it's not in the Buddha's list. He does list fear as a source for going off course, but it's a particular kind of fear, a fear that's imbued with lust, a fear that's imbued with delusion or with anger. Because the quality of fear in and of itself is not necessarily bad. There's the fear of doing something unskillful. There's the fear of doing something that you would later be ashamed to think about having done. The fear of doing something that would have bad consequences. The Buddha actually encourages these kinds of fear. He gives them different names. Shame is one. Compunction is another. But they are forms of fear, and they're skillful. As the Buddha said, you want to see danger where there is danger, and realize there's no danger where there is none. And our problem is that we get them all mixed up through our delusion. And 
ultimately it's that fear that keeps us on course, the fear that we're going to be heedless, the fear that we're going to do something unskillful. That's what alerts us to the fact that we have to be very careful. We just can't go around acting on our greed or acting on our aversion or acting on our delusion without any consequences. Even though we don't tell ourselves the whole story, the whole story actually happens. We don't want to think about the consequences, but the consequences happen. And so it's in our best interest to, to cultivate that kind of fear, not an irrational or illogical or neurotic fear, just a realistic fear. There is aging, there is illness, there is death. And it's followed by more aging, more illness, more death. The question is, how much longer do you want to go through that process? The tears you shed so far, as the Buddha said, are greater than water in the oceans. The blood you've shed so far from having your head cut off in all your various previous lifetimes, that's greater than all the water in the oceans. all that suffering, all that anguish. It comes from a simple thing, being careless. Willingly lying to yourself, wanting a little entertainment, wanting a little gratification for whatever particular desire comes up, because you like the lust, you like the anger. As politicians have discovered, there are people who like to be lied to. It's because they lie to themselves. They've gotten used to it. And the only thing that can really cut through that is, is that sense of fear, the fear of doing something unskillful. Together with the desire for true happiness. So again, not all desire is bad. Delusion is the big problem, which is why we work on developing our mindfulness, developing our... and why we teach ourselves to look at things with both eyes, listen with both ears. If you find yourself fixated on the good side of something, look for the bad. If you're fixated on the bad, look for the good. So you can focus in on the real troublemaker. The part of the mind that wants to lust, the part of the mind that wants to be angry, wants to get worked up about some issue. Where does that come from? Because that's the real troublemaker. The body itself is not a troublemaker. The world outside is not the troublemaker. The, troublemaker, the troublemakers are these desires that come flowing out of the heart, flowing out of the mind and threaten to flood us if we're not careful. So I have a true sense of where the danger lies, and use the Buddha's reflections on the body, use his reflections on goodwill, all the reflections that help give us a picture of the whole story, to force you to step back and say, wait a minute, that's what I've been looking for is not really out there, or it's out there, but it's got all these other things tied to it. And then are not tied in a wonderful sense that you want to celebrate. They're tied to all kinds of suffering, all kinds of harm. So why have I been allowing myself to be so careless, so cavalier about the whole thing? That inspires you to look back, look inside to where the real problem lies and where the solution lies as well. Because that's part of the whole story, too. The Buddha didn't just say that life is suffering. There are four truths that he has you use as a pattern for understanding things. There is suffering and there's the cause, but there's also a path to the end of suffering and a true end to suffering that comes when you've abandoned the cause of suffering.
Those are all truths. And so in addition to fear as a motivator, there's also the desire to see what it's like to put an end to suffering, to test the Buddhist teachings to see if they're true. It's because of the, the fear of what's unskillful and the desire for what's true happiness. That's the motivation for us to want to know what the, true, the whole story is. So we can avoid the dangers and find for ourselves. And the Buddha's promise for true happiness is genuine. It's dangling there. And it would be a shame not to give it a try.